Hey guys, this is Elise. Welcome back to our project and online series of events, Catholic Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. Today I am so pleased to share with you and introduce to you one of my very good friends, Elena. Hey Elise. Hey, hey friends, everyone. <laughs> to have you. I'm so excited to have these conversations with you and share them with our friends. Um, for my first question, I'm curious, what brought you to this? What brought you into participating in this project? What well, you? Yeah, obviously, because, you know, Elise is awesome. <laughs> and I love this idea of just uh, being able to share, you know, in dialogue and conversation about you know our own personal experiences, how we've wrestled and journeyed through our um, identities and how that relates to, of course, this current movement in which we have a lot of people asking questions about um, you know, racial reconciliation and anti-blackness. And I think it's just so important that one, people of faith are having this conversation, but also um, people of color, particularly those who are brown, um, indigenous, um, are in solidarity with their black siblings. And so this hopefully will help some people, whoever is viewing and listening and encourage other people to also wrestle and ask questions and try, try to show up for one another. That's such a beautiful intention. So I'm curious, what are you hoping that, um, I mean, you sort of touched on it, but what are you hoping that people will gain out of this project, both the panelists and those who are encountering it? Yeah, well, I, I'm excited to meet your friends, for one. Like, I, I love connecting with other people's friends and, you know, getting to see uh, different sides of one another and what, what has brought us each together. So, you know, being able to talk to other panelists, but then also, um, I really hope that those who may be tuning in um, can see themselves in some of these stories, uh, know that they're not alone in, you know, either questioning their identities or trying to face their biases or understanding like family <laughs> dynamics, like all of that is an uh, important part of this journey towards anti-racism. And so, I, yeah, I just want people to feel connected. And uh, me connecting the panelists, um, others connecting to us as they listen in, and also feeling connected to their faith as well. I think that's a critical part for me in my identity and a part that um, sometimes we often, you know, say that we want everyone to come to the table with their whole selves. Sometimes, you know, if you talk about like faith, religion, politics, <laughs> people think it's too messy, but that's, that's what shapes us, our values and our beliefs. So I hold all of those things together if possible. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So that's a great place to start. You know, we've known each other now for a few years and it's been a real pleasure for me, but then for others who are first encountering your intro video, um, just to help them get to know you a little bit as they enter these, you know, spaces or events. Um, how would you identify your racial identity? Oh, yes, that's always a fun question. <laughs> uh, so I am definitely a Filipina American. I, I grew up in a biracial family. Uh, you can't tell looking at me, but my dad is white Caucasian. <laughs> was born and raised in Chillicothe in Southern Ohio. And my mom uh, was born and raised in the Philippines mm -hmm. when my dad was in the Navy. So, you know. Colonialism, <laughs> it's all wrapped up in there. Uh, I'll have to say though, um, definitely come from a mixed family and um, it came with and still continues to have its, its challenges, but also is a, a beautiful reflection of what's possible, you know, especially that we're recording today on Loving Day, you know, and the first time that the US was able to recognize interracial relationships and uh, beautiful fabric of our country and the world. And I want to celebrate and honor those things, um, but also recognize that it's also a bit of source of pain, um, at least for me, um, in some areas of my life. And it is for others as well because of, uh, you know, stereotypes to racism, the prejudices that people hold. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. There's a lot in there. I have like a million questions. <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> a 
place to start is um, if you don't mind sharing as much as little as you feel comfortable. Um, what, were, what were some of your early experiences, your first entry points into racial and intersectional experiences, identity development, dialogue, all of the above? <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a process for sure. So even though I was born, let's say I was born in Memphis, actually, you know, my, my younger sister and I, but you know, I was a baby. Um, and when I was one, we, my family moved back to the Philippines and I was raised there until I was six. And so, you know, that was my world, formative part of my life. And then my dad was stationed back in the States and we then moved to Chicago and very much remember, you know, I was like first grade at that point. And being made fun of because I couldn't speak English. And uh, it was just really hard, <laughs> you know, to process that as a young person. And I realized like, oh, I'm different here. Uh, the other kids are different, they treat me differently. And I think that for me was the, the very beginning of, you know, wrestling with my identity because even my mom, you know, like she wanted us to assimilate, uh, she really, didn't, you know, maintain a Tagalog uh, Filipino language for us because she wanted us to fit in. And uh, so I did, I did my best to assimilate. And that, um, that was a huge part of, you know, how I tried to cope, you know, all through elementary, middle to high school. Uh, and, you know, it was part of how my mom and my family also coped as well. And so, you know, after living in Chicago for a couple of years and we moved to Charleston, um, my dad was stationed there as well. And then finally, um, when I was about 11, we moved to Ohio uh, just for coffee, which is an hour south of Columbus. And uh, whew, that was a space in which, you know, it was the first time where there was even less diversity than the other, uh, you know, Navy bases, a little, a little more, uh, diversity there, uh, but definitely in Ohio, I think that's really where it was the most challenging for me, you know, especially because I was, you know, middle school, going to high school, and here I was in this smaller town, and the only two other Asian people in my school were my sisters, <laughs> for one, and, um, you know, just like a handful of Black people, uh, and that's about it, um, and Keep in mind that my sisters uh, take after my dad, so they're a lot lighter skinned, um, you know, passes white. And so it was really tough to, you know, grow up in Ohio and people would ask, you know, like, so are you adopted? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> um, these are my parents, <laughs> these are my sisters um, and my brother. And also to be asked, you know, like, where are you from? You know, that perennial question. And no matter what I would say, it was never enough for, for people, you know, like, I would say, I am from Ohio, <laughs> where's the coffee? And no, um, people would be like, no, no, where are you really from? You know, and I'm like, oh, you want to know, like, why I don't look like you, you know, in a very predominantly white space. And of course, you know, I would tell them my mom from the Philippines, and that would assuage them, you know, but it's just like, exhausting. Um, but those are things I internalized, of course, for myself. Um, it took a long time for me to kind of really embrace <laughs> my Asian identity. Because I did, I really tried to fit in. Um, I wanted to um, not have my straight hair, or I wanted curly hair, <laughs> like everyone else, or all the other girls in high school. And um, yeah, just you know, trying to fit into white European beauty standards. And um, that was a big part of it. And then also, you know, like all, all that being reinforced at home too, you know, like I have my mom, you know, I guess she grew up with her own biases as a, a dark skin person in the Philippines. Um, you know, the lighter you are, the more wealthy, the more beautiful you are. Um, so my mom would constantly tell me, you know, like, don't play in the sun, you're getting too dark and uh, really hard to do because I ran cross country and it got really dark and such. Uh, but it's also just who I am, you know, and so I did. I had a lot of questions, a lot of, um, uh, just, it, it was tough, which I'm sure it's tough for everyone going through high school, but 
uh, add in a lot of those um, microaggressions, uh, not lack of diversity in small town, and oh, that's kind of been my upbringing. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly hear like I'm hearing from what you're sharing that there were challenges internally, like internally to like growing with and growing in your own skin into your own skin and then there were challenges internally like of your core support system and like navigating the narratives of what your mom was trying to share with you because of where she came from certain things were valued and um and that's without talking about her own adjustment to moving around with you know constant constant adjustment being married to a military person and yeah. um and then there's like the narrative of each space tennessee of chicago of southern ohio of a more rural town and compared to a big city and all these competing narratives and then there's a narrative of like peers who are like right there and at least they have the same age as you but then they're like oh we see these other things and we're gonna point them out and then and then like in the wider space of like what is the world saying about this and their support you know of course their circle of family relationships like what is the world say? there's so many things that you are navigating and i I, you know, as I keep finding myself, like, as I do more of these intro videos, I find more of my emotions come up of like, you're my friend. And so I also respond with this very human friend place of like, I want to be there as your friend. You know, I wish I could go back in time to your high yeah. school self and like be there with your high school self. And I keep finding myself, um, I find more of my emotions, like coming towards the video surface of this space. Um, as I do more of these, so I apologize. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> no, thank you. I mean, that's I think that's the beautiful part about this is empathizing with one another, um, sharing these vulnerabilities, and seeing ourselves. That um, and that was a thing, right? Like I didn't have the language or the other peers to process this with who understood these kinds of experiences, and it wasn't until college that I received that. And so <laughs> it's so important um, that we have our community, that we have friends and friends within our own affinity groups um, that, may, that share our same values or even our religion, who again, will understand um, there's, there's lots of growing edges <laughs> in all of that. Yeah, for sure. So I have, a, I have another question. You can share as much or as little as you wish, whatever you feel comfortable. Um, you shared a little bit about that childhood experience, that middle school experience, a little bit of high school, and you know, around middle school, high school, depending on the town and the school's culture, some kids start to date and they start to intermingle and interweave their stories and try to also figure out what do I believe, what do I really think, what's my worldview, and that like starts to really emerge in that high school, college age frame. Um, whether or not people go to college, like age-wise, that usually happens. So um, I'd love to hear from you a little bit on your, and you also made mention of language development. You know, language development is so key to identity development, to, to social interaction and navigating the world. Um, that's why babies learn language very quickly. So um, as a key part of survival. So like in your experience of, racial identity language development and surviving and navigating the world of coming to start to date to um to hear other people's narratives on a more personal level through dating through best friends through exploring worldviews and figuring out your worldview and and you may mention also of being um religious and spiritual a whole a whole person um, I'd love to hear more from you about as you developed, how did those previous narratives feel compounded as you got older? And how did some of them start to deconstruct for you as you formed your own worldview? Yeah, 
<laughs> so we should I to take it. I, I love them a lot. So, <laughs> um, so dating, we actually weren't allowed to date when I was, you know, growing up. It's just, I really didn't date. I uh, didn't try to, I was really, you know, wasn't about trying to uh, challenge my parents. Uh, so wasn't a thing. And in some ways it was good because I did, I was very insecure and I always felt like if I was attracted to someone, then maybe, you know, they could be interested, but I bet they would be more interested in my sister. You know, like I always just thought like they would prefer to <laughs> be with, you know, someone more white and, uh, uh and it wasn't until like college, I, I dated a little bit and I got to like, you know, overcome some of that and where I was like, oh, okay, I am attractive. And I wanted to, you know, like really address that. And that, that was helpful. You know, I had some good relationships in that regard and being able to bring them home and, you know, mom and dad were happy. But I dated mostly white guys and, um, you know, really never a question. And then after college, um, I was in a relationship with a Haitian guy, a guy from Haiti, uh, for a couple of years. And, um, you know, my parents were pretty good about it, with the exception of my mom, who she would always just say very disparaging things about, you know, Black people she saw on the TV, or she'll just say an offhand comment, you know, something that was really very racist. And I would say, mom, you do realize my boyfriend is black, right? And she would say, but he's not that kind of black. And uh, that was really just like, <laughs> uh, you know, again, part of the course though, for my mom, like right, right. blackness in her. Um, but I did, I had to like wrestle through like, okay, my dad's dating white people because, you know, my mom married a white guy. What does this mean? Yeah, it was just, again, who I connected with, who I um, was attracted to at the time. So I dated a bunch of different people, ended up marrying a Mexican guy. We got divorced, but no, that's another story. <laughs> the point is, like, um, thankfully, like, not too much of, like, racial dynamics played into my relationships other than the way that my uh, mom embraced them and uh, again my mom you know even when I was married to a Mexican pastor like she was not <laughs> rude or you know mean to him um by any means uh and I think part of it is also he was he was also light-skinned like, more light-skinned than I am um oh, who knows but definitely dating is a formative part of that it's something that I still you know, think about right now, you know, I'm dating a white guy and why, why is that? And, you know, it's good to question it, but in the end, like the most healthy relationship I've been in and, um, and we teach each other. I have a fun to actually work with him and let him have him see through some of his privilege and, um, yeah, be a great partner with me as, you know, especially now, well, you know, like, being in the streets or supporting friends who are part of the movement for black lives. Like my partner and I can wrestle through that. And he definitely has a lot of blind spots, but he's working through them. And it's nice to have a partner that sees that. Um, I think that's what dating should be, right? Um, and yet, yeah. Conflicting depending on identity and your experiences and your family. Right, right, right. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing those pieces. Um, I mean, I agree. I haven't actually met him yet, but from the things that you've shared, he seems like a good one and really cares for your safety and for your well-being. And um, that's really good. So I'm just really happy for you and okay. all, the, all the things that you've... I, <laughs> I realize that we're not even mentioning it in this video, but anyhow, just from you know meeting you, like just all the things that you have been through and that you've overcome, I'm just really happy that you've met someone who loves you the right way, you know? Yeah. It makes you feel um, that acknowledges your wholeness and vice versa. Yeah. 
I'm really happy for you. And um, there's probably more to, you know, more to chat about, but <laughs> for, for my next question in, in this video, I want to circle back to something you mentioned before with um, how important it is to, to also not only like develop racially, so to speak, or intersectionally, but also to develop um, that holistic spiritual side of ourselves and how great of a resource it could be. Um, and, and it can be a wrestling, even going through that with, with spiritual and religion and, and things like that. And, and I'm curious if you could touch on that a little bit. And um, as you work through it, like, did you experience, did you have racial experiences in those spaces too, or, um, or no? And then if you did, like, how did you, you know, continue on to still maintain like a religion and a, and a spirituality for yourself um, in a, in a way that feels safe to you? And um, if not, then, you know, how did you come about that as well? So I, I kind of know the answers to some of these, but since it's an intro video, yeah, what are you sharing? Right. Yeah, you know, faith, spirituality, religion for me, and it's definitely a love-hate relationship. <laughs> um, very formative part of my life, uh, but challenging in many ways. Um, I actually was not raised uh, in a spiritual household. Um, didn't start going to church until I was like, uh, uh, senior in high school, my neighbor took us. Um, and, and at that time, my, because I went with them, I went to very conservative churches, that was my whole experience of like Christianity. I just thought like everyone thought that way and thought, you know, like you do X, Y, and Z to go to heaven, you don't do these things and you'll go to hell. Um, and that's really just as deep as it went, which is obviously very shallow. And, um, you know, throughout college, Still same kind of circles, very conservative circles. That's when I really started to question everything that I've been taught. Um, yay, liberal arts education. <laughs> but yeah, I think it was a it was a perfect storm though of you know having access to education, but having access to more diverse stories and proximity to people, and seeing like oh, <laughs> there are other ways of looking at the world and why is it that my religion doesn't really honor that kind of questioning and wrestling and um it really it took me a long time you know four years through college like just finally get your nerve just question it and honestly i went to like after college i moved to south bronx uh you know i was gonna be a youth minister and i lived and i worked there and i went because i was like i want to go save these people and that's where I really learned about one, community organizing, and two, about a gospel that is holistic. One, that isn't just about personal salvation, getting to heaven, but that cares about building the kingdom here and now, and that cares about the hells on earth. <laughs> and there I saw the hell of poverty, of redlining, of, um, you know, like, the school to prison pipeline because in the Bronx there are more prisons than there are schools and and so on and that's where I like cut this fire of like wow I've, I've missed so much of my faith and why is that you know and that got me thinking through like it has a lot to do with a culture of whiteness um you know finally developing the language to identify some of this you know eventually went to seminary but really starting to name like as much as I love my Christian faith and as much as it, it absolutely informs uh, my values and my beliefs and passions, it's also rooted in uh, its own sinful legacy of racism and white supremacy. And, you know, it's, it's the good missionaries who thought that they could come over and conquer people's lands and steal children and justify slavery and genocide. And so, it was, you know, it took a lot of time and critical thinking and again, being exposed to different histories and people because I wasn't taught that, you know, it's kind of like how you leave high school and you're like, wow, my history books didn't teach me anything <laughs> about like real life and what, what, whose stories are being told and whose stories are left out and it matters who's telling those stories. And um, because 
I went to predominantly, I think, white churches um, led by white male pastors. I wasn't exposed to a different way, again, of navigating a life that's based on lived experiences. And, and if you are someone who is on the margins and um, then the gospel is very different in the way you experience it. It's liberative. It's one that's about, you know, Jesus coming for the, the poor and the oppressed and those things like, I mean, I missed it. It went over my head completely because again, that it was all very about, you know, piety and legalism for um, my younger years <laughs> and, um, and growing into more a deep and social awareness, a uh, more culturally competent one, one that's more critical of myself and systems. So uh, again, that's why I say it's such a mixed bag because I see that and I still see it today where the, the church has been a source of lots of abuse, of pain, of you know, racism. I mean, it wasn't too long ago when I finally when our churches are desegregated, desegregated and yet still, you know, as Dr. King says, um, church hour, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, still the most segregated hour um, in the U.S. And how can that be, you know? We, we in a Christian faith aspire to be uh, this body, this body of Christ that's supposed to be embracing of um, different gifts, identities. And yet the church is often about like who they're against, right? Like some of them are against LGBTQ people. Some of them are against women <laughs> preaching and leading and some of them may not be as explicit about it, but they are also against black leadership. And uh, it's, it's there because again, we're all messy, we're sinful, <laughs> these things. And so anyways, a lot of my work now is trying to like reclaim that space and um, try to show a better way, hopefully a more faithful way uh, that isn't as fundamentalist and legalistic, even though I, I have to say progressive people can be the same way as well, you know? Um, but yeah, oh faith. But in the end, you know, like, I love Jesus. And <laughs> Jesus, uh, not because he was radical or, you know, revolutionary, but just has just changed my heart, my life, and the way that um, I want to serve and how I want to be with other people. And, for me, that's Jesus. For others, it's a, a whole different, you know, belief system or religious figure. Um, but that's that's my faith for now, and I'm sure it'll evolve and shift. And yeah, we'll see how it goes because it's definitely <laughs> it's taken <laughs> quite a you know, especially in denominational ecumenical sense, a, a different journey. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like there's. There's, a, there's been a lot of layering, a lot of marinating, a lot of twists and turns, um, self-reflection. You did a lot of heavy carrying for yourself and what a beautiful gift it is that you're giving to others to help them carry their own and work through these tough topics of identity development and community development and family culture. Um, I mean, I could talk with you for hours and I have like so many more questions, but thank you so much for sharing today from your heart and in this unscripted way. Um, I'm just so excited for everyone to stay tuned, to be um, witnesses and to be part of conversation with my friend Elena, with all the other friends who are panelists in this project. And um, with that, we'll, we'll, um, we'll wish you all a blessed day and we'll be in touch. Thanks, friend. Can't wait to come back together and <laughs> chat some more. <laughs> Thank you.